Good evening. Charles Church of God. <laughs> this reminds me of that story about that fellow who went to church and his heathen pastor's the only one there. He said, well, Pastor, well, I guess since you don't hear, I said, I guess we'll just go ahead and dismiss church. He said, well, Pastor, he said, well, I go, to, I go to the pastor, I feed my chicken and cows. I said, well, one, one cow show up, I feed that one cow, you know. And he said, yeah, Pastor, you know, that's yes, right. I said, man, he preached about an hour and a half, got through that. And he said, well, what do you think of that sermon? He said, well, it was a good sermon. He said, but, you know, when I go to feed that one cow, I said, I don't give that cow the whole bale. So, <laughs> we, we, we don't want you to give us the whole bale tonight. We want to, we want to rejoice in God. Anyway. We're here for it. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and rejoice in God. There's no reason not to, right? That's right. Come on, Dad. Get us singing. We're going to sing, He is Lord. We're just going to sing a couple of times. God, to lead us and to guide us to all truth. And Lord, we come together tonight, few, but we're seeking you in spirit and in truth. We're seeking to worship you, Father. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, for all the provisions that you give for your body and your church. And I pray that you would open our hearts tonight, God, and just let us receive this engrafted word that's able to save our souls, that's able to build us up and strengthen us and create us in your image. And Lord, I pray that you would anoint me tonight to preach the word of truth, God, that you would give me boldness, God, and you would give me clarity so that your word would be understood. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I also want to uh, do the prayer request. I hesitated to do that. We need to pray for Sister Louise Hargett. Uh, she's still going through some stuff with her health. We need to pray for Isabel Hayes, for Shirley Hargett. She's not feeling real well. Uh, Barbara Heron, Amy and Dustin Rowe, Karen Bryant, and Katie Kidd. Is anyone else? Um, Mr. Earl Maddox, M-A-D-D-O-X. Earl Maddox. Uh, he's the husband of our nursing home director up here. Okay. And administrator, right? Right. And he's got some serious issues with some kind of infection in his back. Uh-huh. He's really, he's been paralyzed. I don't know. Okay. He's in bad shape. All right. 
any, anyone else. All right, let's just pray for those people. Lord, we come back before your throne asking you to touch those people that we've lifted up to you tonight, Father. Lord, I pray that you continue to work in their natural body and their, their spirits. Lord, I pray that you would just help us all, Father, because we can do nothing without you, Father. And I know you're the one that heals us. You're the one that gifts us with all great things in Christ Jesus and the power of your spirit. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, tonight, I'm going to continue. Uh, this, the message tonight is called Seeking for Answers. And it's on the lines of what we studied last week, kind of a continuation of that. I'm going to be reading tonight from John chapter 14. I'm going to start out with verse 6. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Praise the Lord. You know, in this mixed up world that we live in, there's a group of people claiming to be seekers after truth. All over the place, you see people that they claim to be seeking after truth. It says, we're seeking truth, they boast, and, and as if it qualifies them as acceptable worshipers. But no matter what their beliefs might be or the truth that they're seeking, they try to tie it in with the kingdom of God. They try to tie it in with the church as we know it. And some churches actually encourage or uh, accommodate the strange idea and invite people to come to church says, you don't have to believe anything. Just come and seek truth. Just come. That's what we do is seek truth. And to me, this seems to infer a certain openness of mind that accepts anything and everything. You have to be very careful who you worship with these days because we're in the last days. Y'all know that. It says in the last days there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be people that are speaking truth. But is it the truth of God? It's partial truth. Uh, in this dangerous frame of mind, when people do that, truth is not absolute. But whatever you think of at the time is truth, it can be truth to you. Or whatever you have determined to be the truth. You know, it's it's really sad. I remember several years ago, well, it's been a good while ago, when Jim Jones talked to these people into going to Ghana with him. And, and he was, man, he was preaching to them. They were believing. They were following his truth. And 431 people drank the Kool-Aid. And they died because they followed him in a partial truth, but it wasn't God's truth. Same thing happened with a man named David Koresh. It's happened many times in our lifetime where false leaders, the hell Bob Comet, they, they followed him to their death. And they were seeking truth. These people were sincere. They were seeking truth. But they didn't line up with God or the Bible or, or the Word. And we have to be very careful. Um, on the surface, these truth seekers seem to be genuine, very genuine in their belief, or at least given the idea that they're headed in the right direction. And But nevertheless, in this day of many falling away, truth means different things to different people, doesn't it? And there is a great falling away from the church. And uh, what's truth to one person might not necessarily be true to another. And let me explain this. That is in the natural. But even God says in the Bible, what sin for one man might not be sin for another, but the reason it says that is because they haven't come to the revelation or the knowledge that that's sin. They don't have, they haven't received the truth and the spirit. See, if you, you can't have one or the other. You have to have truth and spirit because without the spirit, the truth is dead doctrine. But with the spirit, the spirit gives life to it. And that's what gives us understanding. But do you remember the old Church of God days? You know, and what was true yesterday might not necessarily be true to another, for another day. And that's honest, because let me tell you, do you remember the old Church of God days? Did you go to movies or cut your hair or wear jewelry? Did some of you not do those things? And, and, and that's okay, that was, that was the Church of God guidelines, but the only thing these seekers after truth accomplish in doing these things is to keep people from seeking the absolute truth, which is Jesus Christ. You know, some of these things are silly that we used to do. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we come into the acknowledgement of truth and sometimes we realize that it's not so much like the Pharisees thought about the laws or what we put on or what we do this way or that way. It's about seeking Jesus. 
in all things. Yes, ma'am. Because you wore your class ring, yeah. I mean, they, they were really serious about it. Yeah, yes, ma'am. But see, and, and things like that to me, and, and I'm not belittling the Church of God the old ways or anything, but I'm just saying those things right there are not pertinent to salvation. You know, what it is is seeking truth, seeking the real truth in spirit and Jesus Christ and becoming like him, God making us into his image. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change. So if we keep our eyes on him, we'll be okay. Uh, then there are those who inform us that there is truth in every religion. You hear it all the time on television. There's truth in every religion. Uh, they don't even try and convince you that there are more than one path that leads to God. But we just read the scripture. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, except by me. And that we, they even tell you we serve the same God, it's just a different name. See, that's all manipulation is what it is. It's partial truth. Although my God has many names, there is only one true God, and, and his name is Jesus. Uh, and John 17, 3 says, And in this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. But that's truth, church. They'll tell you there's truth in every religion, but that's like saying there's that's like saying there's water in most poisons, so it's all right to drink it. It's not the water that kills, it's the poison. And the more unclear or inexact the poison is, the more dangerous it is. And the closer it is to the real thing, the more dangerous it becomes and the more damage it does. And Satan the enemy of mankind's soul knows this well, I promise you. And uh, he tries to mix a poison truth into the church. And when you study the religions of this world, you'll find much in them that is true. There's a lot of truth in, in different religions, but however, partial truth is more dangerous than trickery. So hear me when I warn you about this. When I know something is an outright lie, I can stay away from it. When I know it's an outright lie, it, it doesn't bother me because it doesn't get under my skin. I can stay away from it. But going back to the beginning of poison truth, back to the Garden of Eden, we see this. The serpent did not outright lie to Eve. He simply told her a partial truth. And that's what he did, a partial truth. He only told her what he wanted to tell her in order to mislead her that he could manipulate. And that's going on today in churches all over the world. It's going on in religions all over the world. They tell you just enough truth to get the hook in, and then they manipulate you where they want you to go and how they want you to worship. Uh, he only told her what he wanted to, and it's what he did not tell her that created all the problem following the fall in the garden. Uh, you can tell someone something and not actually lie to him or her, but convincingly mislead them that it, it is truth. You know, and that truth keeps this person from real truth. Uh, we can all load up and go to the Memphis Zoo tomorrow. Every one of us in here can load up and go to the zoo. Well, we don't even have to go to the zoo to see animals in Memphis, but we can all load up and go to the zoo and see the animals. And then when we come to the tiger cage, and there's a tiger lying in the cage over there, and all of us are looking at it, and it's laying there like a big kitty cat, just licking itself and, you know, pawing at the at the thing and looking at us and licking herself and laying there and you might think, oh, he's so cute. He's in a playful mood. And it rolls over and just, you know, throws its paws up in the air. Why, well, it's just a big kitty cat. But the tiger, he can be declawed and he can have his teeth extracted, but the partial truth doesn't change the nature of that tiger, does it? It's a tiger. Sorry. Uh, but the tiger, it doesn't change it. I read about the tiger. That's why I know you're wrong and not me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I read about the tiger, and it says the tiger is, a, is built to be a killing machine. Man, in the jungles, they had to watch it during wars. A tiger was, is a killing machine. Even without teeth and without claws, it can kill a man. Tigers are tough. But those who boast their secrets after truth are putting themselves in a bad position because it's what you don't know that can hurt you. 
And if you don't know about the tiger's nature, he can fool you. And the tiger can only harm the body. That's the, that's the bad thing. The tiger can only harm the body, but these partial religious truths that are being spread today can effectively lead someone into everlasting spiritual darkness and to eternal damnation. So that's why it's more dangerous than a tiger because it's the false truth is what gets you. Every, every false religion in the world has a base of truth about it. Every one of them. Even witchcraft has a base of truth. You know, but it doesn't even have to be intentionally done to mislead someone or lead you astray. It starts with some truth and then moves away from it subtly and maliciously, just like the serpent did to Eve. Eve did not intentionally disobey God. He did not. He didn't intentionally, she didn't intentionally uh, disobey God or knowingly move away from ultimate truth. When it comes to worshiping and our relationship with God, we must be quite careful, church, that we're not basing it on partial truth, but on the entire revealed truth, such as it can be found in the Bible. That's where people mess up. You know, I hear people all the time say stuff like, well, the Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. Show me that scripture. It's not in there. Several things that people quote as truth is partial truth, but it's not the truth from the Word of God. And I've heard them say, well, God helps those who help themselves. It don't say that in the Bible. It said he's our help in time of need, our present help in time of need. And so many things might sound good, but it's not part of Jesus. It's not part of the written Word. So we have to be very careful when we hear people speak truths. Uh, when it comes to to worshiping God and our relationship with God, we must be quite careful that we are being based on the unadulterated word of God and not partial truths, but on the entire revealed truth. Mankind wants to worship God. We've talked about that for several weeks, but he wants to worship God after his own comprehension of truth. And that's the problem. That's thus the fall of mankind. That's what Eve was doing. I mean, Satan told her some things, and he misled her a little bit, but she had what her comprehension of truth. She wanted to be like God. She didn't think that was a bad thing, but she didn't get the original revelation Adam did. And it says she caused Adam to fall. So partial truths can manipulate anyone, anyone. Um, we've been studying, and we've learned that there is an imperative longing to worship deep within the heart of mankind. But with God, there's no tolerance and there's no broad spirit. Uh, there's a sharp pinpoint of fact so that everyone that walks in his or her own fallacy of truth is completely rejected by God. Their worship is completely rejected. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Whew, that's kind of heavy when you think about that. And what I mean by that is the partial truth. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And few there be that find that truth outside of your, the Spirit of God. That's why Jesus said it. That's why I say it. Every week we must worship in spirit and in truth because one's dead without the other. And you can't do one or the other. It's got to be both of them. That's God's formula. Now, it's, it's just this simple. People who have not found God and have not experienced the new birth and the infilling of the Holy Ghost still have the ancient impulse to worship something, don't they? They're going to worship something. And if they happen to come from a third world country, where there's little or almost no education, they might kill a chicken and put a feather on their head and dance around a fire and call a witch doctor. And they think that's truth because that's all they know. But then there are those that are more fortunate, educated people who happen to live in a country like America and say poetry. I don't know about y'all, but I love poetry. Uh, the Bible has five books of poetry in it. Y'all know what they are? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, 
and Ecclesiastes. Those are the five books of poetry in the Bible, and I love those books. Uh, I read them a lot. But let me give you an example of a very educated uh, individual. And how would I say this? He was not believing, I guess you'd say. He wasn't an atheist. He just hadn't accepted Christ, hadn't accepted God. Uh, and he wrote this poem. And I want to give you an, a, an example. His name was Edward Markham. If, you, if some of you may have heard of him. He was an American poet in the late 1800s, hundreds in the early 1900s. I think he died in like 1925 or six. But uh, he wrote Lincoln, the poem Lincoln, which is very, very famous. And he wrote The Man with the Hope. And that's a very famous poem. And believe me, that's, that's good poetry. But I want to quote him tonight as an example of the way the human mind goes. Uh, the world is full of poetry like this that you can throw out. The kind of poetry and religion that has no anchor, no God, no high priest, no blood, no altar, no sacrifice. But it floats around like a, like a butterfly. And it's floating and flittering about, not quite where it, knowing where it wants to go. And they all say about the same thing. But I want to read this poem from Edward Markson. Markham, I mean. I made a pilgrimage to find the God. I listen for his voice at holy tombs, search for the prints of his immortal feet in the dust of broken altars, yet turned back with empty heart. But on the homeward road, a great light came upon me, and I heard the God's voice singing in a nesting lark, felt his sweet wonder in a growing rose, received his blessing from a wayside well, looked on his beauty in a lover's face, saw his bright hand send a signal from the sun. Now, he was a good poet in many regards, but his scientific study of birds was not very sound. Because in the first place, nesting larks do not sing. And in the second place, he said that he heard God singing like a bird. Have you read anywhere in the Bible that God sang like a bird? No. Then he said, I felt his sweet wonder in a rose and received his blessing from a, a wayside well. Looked on his beauty in a lover's face. Saw his bright hand signal from the sun. Now there you have it. Not a crazy man, not a witch doctor from Haiti or Africa. Here's a man whose poetry is crazy. It is crazy what he says in this poem. He writes among the poets of the world and he goes out looking for God and he searched for him in the first place, a graveyard. God's not in the graveyard. And he did not find him, it says. And he looked at a broken altar. God's not going to be at a broken altar. That's craziness. And then he says he could not find him there. Then on the way back, he hears a bird singing and says, that's God. And then he sees a happy lover holding hands with another lady, with another lover probably, and says, that's God. And he sees a, a rose waving in the wind, and he says, that's God. So he comes home and he writes himself a poem. Now, I want to know, how could he get it so off, so bad? How could this man in a land full of Bibles, with a gospel being preached, write that he went looking for God in altars and tombs and in all dark, dusty, dry places, yet he didn't find him? And he started home and he saw him and he heard him singing and the bird and he saw him in a rose and he saw him in the face of a young lover. Then he looked up and lo and behold, God was signaling from the sun. I don't know about you, but I've never had any signals from the sun myself. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N I have. And I don't know anyone except for Edward Markham who even wrote about it, God signaling from the sun. Maybe he stayed out in the sun too long. I don't know. But this kind of thing, this error of truth, it seems to me needs to be exposed. It may sound beautiful rolling off the tongue, but it's a lie. And people fall for those truths. They fall for these things. That's why I'm constantly quoting John 4, 24. We need to tell the world that God is the spirit and that they, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship him in spirit alone, for the spirit without truth is helpless. Even the spirit without truth is helpless. 
And you can't worship him in uh, truth alone, for that would be the theology without the Holy Ghost fire, without the Holy Ghost leading. Did not the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, I will give you the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. You can't have it without it. It'll be a partial truth, but it won't be God's spiritual truth. Now, it must be the truth of God and the Spirit of God. That's the only way truth comes. When a man or a woman yielded and believing the truth of God is full of the Holy Spirit of God, then their smallest whisper will be one of worship if you're filled with the Spirit. So we can establish the fact that we will worship God by any means if we are full of the Spirit and yielded to the truth. There's nothing that can hold you back. That is pure worship and undefiled. But only the admiration and worship of the creation is found outside of either one of those. People begin to worship things around them. People begin to worship what they feel good about. And uh, God cannot receive that kind of worship. His holy heart just won't let that kind of worship that we choose to give him that doesn't come from his spirit of truth, he won't let it, he won't let it come in. He can't accept that. And uh, Jesus spoke it, and it is forever to be implemented what he said to the woman at the well in John 4, 24. And remember our opening statement. Keep in mind that there's only one way to God. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And instead of being nice or charitable by allowing the idea to stand that God accepts worship from anybody, anywhere, we're actually injuring and jeopardizing the future of those people and the people that we allow them to spread that to by spreading, spreading, spreading false truth. Anything apart from the spirit and truth is incompatible with the holy nature of God and only dangerous and it damages a person's soul and ultimately leads them down a broad path to destruction that we read about a while ago. It's an either or situation. Uh, either a worshiper must submit to God, must submit to his truth, or he cannot worship God at all. A person can write poems and books and he can get elaborate thoughts and when he sees a sunrise he can have all these bright ideas but he can see roses waving in the wind and he can see and receive some type of revelation from nature but he cannot worship God except in faith. Why? Because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. And you can't have faith if you don't know him. You have to know him. Uh, he would have to confess that God is who he says he is and it's what he says he is. And he would have to declare that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and what he says he is. He has to own up to the truth about himself and admit that he is as bad a sinner as God says he is. Then he must acknowledge the truth of atonement, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses and delivers us from all sin. Finally, he has to come God's way. See, that's the only way to know truth. He must be renewed after the image of the one who created him. That's how we become one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, he says that when we're saved, Paul said in Romans, that our mind has to be renewed. Why? Because it's a fleshly, carnal mind. And we can't, we don't know the thoughts of God. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his forgiveness, that we're able to come before the throne and say, Father, change me. Father, make me into the image of the one that is you, Jesus Christ. Make me into his image. When Jesus came into this world, it says that his own people didn't recognize him. They had been waiting for thousands of years for the Messiah. And when he came, it says his own received him not. Not only did they not receive him, but they rejected him fully. They persecuted him. They hung him on a cross. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was called the friend of sinners. You know, Jesus really didn't care what any of the religious people thought. And you know, we got to get that out of our minds in these last days. 
It doesn't matter what religious people think about you and about me. It matters what God thinks about you and about me. It matters what kind of a relationship we have. Is it in spirit? Is it in truth? Is it just in the law? That's what happened to the Pharisees. Their worship was just in the law. When Jesus said, I fulfill the law, they tore their clothes and screamed. They said, who does this man think he is? And he was God trying to save his own people, but yet they believed a partial truth that came from religion. I'm here to tell you tonight, relationship is greater than religion. The Bible says the problem with the Pharisees and the scribes and, and those Jews in that day is they put everything they had, all their faith in the letter of the law. And Jesus said, the letter of the law kills, but the spirit gives life. And they couldn't understand that. They had a partial truth, but they couldn't receive the way, the truth, and the life. And I thank God that he opened our hearts, our minds, the ones here tonight. I know everyone in here is saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he opened our hearts and our minds, and he's renewing us day by day. You know, we're not done yet. That I, I, I just can't stand, and, and y'all excuse me, but I can't stand those pastors and those Christians that think they've arrived. I haven't gotten nearly where I want to be. I know he's doing a work in me every day. I fail, but by the grace of God, I get back up, and I go before him and say, Father, forgive me. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Renew my spirit. Create in me a clean heart and a right spirit, and make me like you. And if we don't do that, then... I don't believe we know what truth is. So we've got to stay in the word. We've got to live our life according to the, how the spirit moves us. And so these people, they, there's people that have church meetings and even church meetings in their house. And they pray in the name, I was reading this the other day, they pray in the name of all good and all father. And they have no idea what true worship is. And acceptable worship is in the eyes of God. And they stumble and lead others into spiritual darkness. And I would rather go out and stroll through this town with my New Testament. I can find my God. Not the God in a rose. Not the God that sits on a, a, the highway and the byway. But I can take a walk in this town and just in my mind, see, if you, don't, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if the Word is not in your heart, then you're in trouble. I can't memorize the whole Bible, don't get me wrong. But there are scriptures that God and the Holy Spirit has placed in my heart. And I can get out here and walk around and I can start meditating on God, on His Word. And the Holy Spirit can come on me. And I'm not seeing, like this man in the poem, I'm not seeing God in birds or, or sun or any of this stuff. What I'm seeing is Jesus on the right hand of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm seeing him by faith. No, I've never seen Jesus in the flesh, but I know that he died for me. And I know that he rose again on the third day, and I know that he's on the right hand of God, ever interceding for everyone in this church and everyone that's been born again in spirit and in truth. And I can commune with him outside this building. You hear me? Y'all listen to me. So many people think that worshiping is going to church. That's a good place to worship, but that's not the only place. We should worship all the time. You know, Smith Wigglesworth once said, and this is very important too to remember, he was being interviewed by an English newspaper and they were kind of being snippy about him. And that, that guy said, have you ever prayed for an hour? I pray for an hour every day. And he said, no, I cannot say that I've prayed for an hour, but I can, can say that I've never won an hour without praying. So that's what's important. It's not about the words and time. And I spend an hour on my knees, but there should an hour go by that we don't thank God or ask him for help or ask him something because he's the only one that can help us. And I find myself more and more in these days in my mind asking God, Lord, help you with this. Or God, reveal this to me. Or why is this happening, Lord? Show me what I do need to do here because without that, I make mistakes. But if you ask, the Spirit moves because He knows what you're seeking. And we must teach and understand that the Holy Spirit only depends on a heart that is kingdom bound. 
out of proper and sincere biblical worship. That's what he's looking for. God will call you to work for the kingdom. And, but he is not interested in what you think is worship. God will call you to work for the kingdom, but he'll call you to work through his commands, not what we think about. And true worship is a, is, a, is a moral command. And yet I believe that it's missing the missing jewel in church circles today. I really do. The crown is here, but the jewels are missing. The church has decked herself with every possible ornament. But one shining gem is missing, the true gem of worship in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to tell you something. This has very practical implications to the local church when I say this. For example, a man who will, a man who will uh, never attend a prayer meeting finds himself on the church board or the, or the church council making decisions for the entire church. He would never go to a prayer meeting because he is not a worshiper. He is just a fellow who runs the church. And in his mind, he can and does separate the two. Brothers and sisters, you cannot separate the two. I do not believe that any man or woman has a right to decide a church issue or vote on anything unless he or she is a praying, worshiping, spirit-filled child of God. Only a person who worships in spirit and truth has the ability to make spiritual decisions within the local church. And if we're not all worshipers, we're wasting other people's money and only piling up wood and hay and stubble to be burned in the last day. It might be business as usual, but it's not glorious worship. Worship is the most awesome thing, church. And I'd rather worship God than anything I know. Let's pray. Father, oh God, how beautiful and awesome is the work of thy son Jesus in our lives in the power of your Holy Spirit. It fills the whole universe, Father, with wonder and awe and admiration, God. My heart is overwhelmed with the power of that work within me and within the body of Christ. We seek you tonight, but only find you when we seek you with our whole heart and our minds and our spirits and our strength, God. Our love and wonder for you has always become our anthem of worship. Your presence is our comfort both day and night. Father, help us. Fill us with your fullness and keep us until the great day of your return. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remember, church, don't let partial truth get in the way.